Christopher Eccleston, you play Matt Jameson on The Leftovers, and you're currently in Austin. You've been filming, I think, for about a week on season three. How is that going so far? Um, it's going very well. Uh, it's great to be back here. You know, we had a very good experience in Austin last year. It's a great city. Um, and uh, one, of the one of the expressions for Austin is keep Austin weird. And I can't think of a better home than the leftover for the leftovers than somewhere that prides itself on being weird. Yeah, I think that's perfectly apt, actually. Um, now, I know you can't say a lot, but you can imagine that most of us are just absolutely desperate to know something about season three. Are you allowed to say a thing, or do I just move on? <laughs> Damon Lindelof is, is just across the room with a crossbow. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not going to do it, Damon. I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> what can I tell you? I can tell you very little apart from it, to expect the unexpected. Um, I think you know who are coming back, which characters are coming back. Yeah. Um, and there's been a bit of a time jump. Nice. Okay, that's something that I, I can hold on to. I think, it, I think I can say that. I think... Um, yeah, I think you can say that. And um, when, when I spoke to Damon a couple of weeks ago, he mentioned that you know the, the theme for season three will be more apocalyptic, he said. It will be um, how do people deal with the knowledge or the belief that maybe the apocalypse is on the horizon. So we're looking forward to that. It looks like it's going to be really exciting third and final season. Yeah. See. Um, so look, for people who have been living under a rock or who aren't totally familiar with the show, how, would you, how do you describe your character when you're discussing the show with people? Like, What's the best way to you, th you think to describe Reverend Matt? Oh, well, the facts that I have are that he is an Episcopalian reverend. Um, he is a man who has had, due to the great departure, has had a great um, struggle with his faith, um, but surprisingly has held on to his faith. He is a believer. He identifies, albeit possibly unconsciously, with Job from the Bible. Um, he found, uh, I think he found within the teachings of Job in the book, some he was able to make some sense of his experience, the fact that he wasn't one of the chosen. And of course, we had the debate in, in series one where he was um, a departure denier, um, as we know, as you know. Um, he's had some extraordinary things happen to him in season two in um, Jarden. I think, I think you're all up to speed with those yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Mary waking up, etc. Yep. Mary being pregnant. So he is, um, as ever, Matt is in search of the answer and he's in search of a congregation. He has a very powerful ego. You know, he likes, yeah. he enjoys a position of leadership. Yeah. And I would say that a really critical plot point is that, you know, the sudden departure is so inexplicably random you know, it wasn't just good people being ushered through to the pearly gates. It wasn't just bad people suddenly evaporating into thin air. And Matt is one of those people who is, well, he's like the embodiment of trying to explain or reason with why people have left, especially in season one. What were your thoughts on that aspect of his character? He was so tenacious and so desperate to work out or to prove departed. He, he kind of turned into um, a gutter press journalist, didn't he, in season yeah. one? Mm. He was taking all the skeletons, and I know a lot about the gutter press coming from the UK. Uh, he was taking all the skeletons out of people's closet um, to try and prove that this was not God's work because God would not have selected pedophiles and rapists and thieves. But possibly um, Matt had to examine his faith and what God represents to him. Um, a little more closely. Uh, what was the question? Sorry, I went off track. It was really, it was really just a point that I'm um, just about. Matt is a really interesting character, and we, and we really learnt more about him, especially in the first season episode, Two Boats and a Helicopter, which, to my mind, to many, was one of the strongest episodes of the first season. Um, 
take us back to um, that particular episode and, and your reaction to when you read the script and, and then the highlight of actually um, making it. Oh, I was, I was mindlessly excited to be doing a stand, you know, a standalone episode where I was in every scene for HBO um, was an ambition fulfilled. You know, I've wanted to work on HBO. I've wanted to work in America. And the really fantastic story about that episode for me was that when I was around about 18 and started to think about being an actor, I went to the, my local cinema and I saw a film called Christine and there was a, an actor in it called Keith Gordon who gave this extraordinary performance which really had an impact on me because he played, and it's good keeping Matt in mind, played a, a very sympathetic character who became very unsympathetic. And it turned out that that actor was my direct director. Um, it, I was very nervous, you know, I was working in an American accent surrounded by natural American speakers and I was carrying an episode. Um, but the writing was so strong and has been so consistently strong, particularly for Matt. Uh, me and Damon started off with a great conversation about what Matt was about. Um, that when a script's that good, you know, you can hardly fail, really. It, it really is, I've said it throughout my career, the most important thing in the television and film we make and theatre we make is the writer and the writing. Yeah. Any actor could play that role and got good reviews. Just don't yeah. get in the way of the writing was my feeling. Don't get in the way. And the writing especially is is so good on the leftovers. You know, yeah. Two Boats and a Helicopter, I think was a turning point for a lot of people who started watching a show, weren't really sure if it was for them. Two Boats and a Helicopter, for me, just as my personal experience is when it clicked, is when I thought this is the kind of show that I want to watch. And, uh, and it just obviously progressed from there. Um, I was you know, then so totally moved by Matt's other episode in season two. So you had another really strong episode in um, season two where, you know, No Room at the Inn, where, um, you know, Matt is struggling with Mary's comatose condition or however you want to call it and is trying desperately to duplicate the way she woke from her deep freeze originally. Um, so take us back to that one because that, I didn't think you were able to top two boats in a helicopter, but you did because No Room at the Inn yeah. was, was a real highlight. Yeah. Um I think just to go back to what you said about season one, I think, you know, Damon has said and the writers have said that in the, se in the first season, you're searching for your formula, you're searching for your voice. And I think Damon decided that using uh, one, uh, one character episodes was the way the leftovers should go. So you, you saw more of it, I think, in series two. And I think possibly you will see more of it in in series three. But speaking about that episode, um, I was, um, again, I was incredibly fortunate in my director, um, Nicole Cassell, who um, did, a, did a film called The Woodsman. Um, what Damon has done brilliantly, I feel, is he's, he's he, you know, he's cast certain actors brilliantly with certain directors, you know, who, the people he's put me with, for instance, he's obviously understood that we would gel and mesh. Mm. And I loved Matt of Series 2. He, um, I became obsessed with listening to Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks and the alternative version, Blood on the Tapes. There was something about that album that fed for me um, Matt's journey. I, I loved his resilience. I mean, he's an incredibly strong man uh, when you think of what's been thrown at him. And his love for, for Mary is so pure and so dedicated. And his ability to, his durability and his, his ability to find hope happened again, time and time and again in that. Um, I mean, physically, Matt always looks up. And of course, in that series, there was one time when he looked up and suddenly he saw the cross and then he met Sandy and the, the stuff with the cricket bat and then he found his way <laughs> through the tunnel. Um, his ability to endure is job-like and admirable. Absolutely. You know, um, you've been working for a very long time. You've, um, you know, you've got a great um, resume in theatre and film and TV. What was it about The Leftovers, though, that, wanted, that you wanted to, um, to do it? Why did you decide to, or how did you become involved with The Leftovers, I should say? Tom Perotta's novel. I'd, um, yeah. um, 
I love Tom's writing. Uh, I was handed the novel about two years before The Leftovers went into production by a very brilliant British director who works a lot for HBO called Julian Farino. Yeah. And he said to me, have a look at this book. I think they're going to do something with it. I read the book and I alerted my agent to the existence of the show, that the, the show was in development. Um, and I suggested through the grapevine that I play Matt Jameson. Damon was shocked because Matt appears for a couple of pages. But we met when he was um, publicizing uh, Star Trek II in London and we had a big conversation about faith uh, of our own uh, or lack of. And from my point of view as an actor with some experience, you look at an Episcopalian reverend where the departure has possibly happened and he's not been taken. That is a tremendous dramatic character it's almost greek you know it's like oedipus or something um it, it, it's just got so much potential and damon took it from there and made me um nora durst's brother and uh introduced the idea of job so yeah i put myself forward for it unfortunately i got it mm. and here we are that um, with damon yeah Absolutely. You know, um, I, I always wonder this as well, given your experience, um, have you found anything in particular about your work on The Leftovers to date particularly challenging or something that you really had to take stock about, you, you know, the way that you, um, that you work? On a technical level, I had to deal with the accent, which is now fine. Um, I do think, even though we've got a great deal of kind of East Coast actors on the show, a lot of people have worked in theatre. Not hugely big names, uh, apart from Liv and perhaps Justin. A lot of theatre actors. Um, one thing I was familiar with from my background was uh, a sense of ensemble, which we have in The Leftovers with certain people leading. Um, but, you know, British actors do not get as much exposure to the camera as American actors. I think, you know... American acting is, 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 is very um, familiar with the camera. So I've learned from watching actors like Justin Thoreau, um, Anne Dowd, Carrie Coon, um, people, the relaxation that Americans have in front of the camera, you know, their understanding of the technical, ability, technical issues. Um, yeah, you can never stop learning when you're doing my job, which I think is one of the main attractions. You've always got yeah. to be open. Absolutely. Um, you, you were nominated by the broadcast critics for two years running for your work on the show, which was a really great achievement given that there is so much good TV on TV these days. It's, there's so much competition. But yet you were nominated twice. Um, and I think the critics in general have been so critical, pardon the pun, in keeping the leftovers you know, in the uh, consciousness, so to speak. What, what's, what are your views on the critical reaction to the show? Well, you know... We didn't get that great uh, critical reaction um, in the first season. We got engagement where, where critics were, were wrestling with what we were trying to do, which we appreciated. Uh, and by and large, you know, they, they kept us afloat. But in the second series, and quite rightly, in my opinion, because of the quality of the writing and the work, Justin, for instance, who led us through that, uh, the critics really fell in love with us. And I, I don't think HBO could ignore that. I, really, I mean, the difference between series one and series two in terms yeah. of critical reception was extraordinary. We were like, we were, you know, a revelation. And it was, I was so pleased for Damon and his writers because they, they took, you know, they took some of the knocks from the reviews of series one. And of course, Damon's familiar with Flack, with what yeah. happened with the, the finale of Lost. And they just spun on a dime, really, mm -hmm. and, and took it a step further and continued not to conform and continued to be provocative and continued to be essentially the leftovers. We kept our tone. Um, and the critics were, were great to us. You know, yeah, I think the show struck a really great balance. Obviously, there was a transition to a lighter tone for season two, and Damon yeah. explained that to me in quite a lot of detail, that there was a, it was a conscious effort, given the critical reaction, 
Um, obviously, you felt that that transition to a lighter tone worked, but what? Tell us um, really what your reactions were when you first started seeing the script for season two. I think one thing for us all to think about is the fact that series one was dealing with an existing novel. And I know Damon and Tom have such a great relationship. To see them two together, they'll, if we have a launch or something, they'll go up and they'll make a speech together. And they're like a fantastic double act. I think, you know, you've got a friendship for life with those two men. And I think Damon very much wanted to honor the novel. And I feel like once we've done that with series one, Tom said, it's yours now. And anybody who meets Damon Lindelof, He's funny, isn't he? I mean, you deal, Damon yeah. moves through life with ferocious intelligence and great humor. And I think possibly, in a sense, Damon fell off the leash in series two. You know, he served the book, and now he was doing what he, he really did best, which is create original television. So I think um, that's important for us to think about, that we were serving a novel, and we're now, we've got nothing to do with the novel now. Um, I was delighted to read the humour because, you know, we're quite a knockabout crew, really. They, they just in leads us impeccably, and that's not been highlighted enough in the press. The example that guy has set in terms of just the basics, punctuality, hard work, and generosity, but great humour. And uh, the, stru the struggle, the characters finding humour within the series allowed allowed the audience in more and more. We had a more variety of tone, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It really and did work. Continue, that, that really continues in, uh, in Series 3. Oh, good. Yeah, the question was going to be whether that tone continues. And also, um, we now know the production and the story are moving eventually to Australia. Um, and, you know, Australia has this um, strange or this very important part to play in the story of The Leftovers. Um, are you looking forward to that um, transition, to moving across well, the planet? I've not heard the official announcement yet uh, okay. that we're going to Australia. That's kind of news to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it broke in the press last week, but I guess that's all we can say. We just have to wait and see. Okay. Okay. So that's a possibility, Australia. Hmm. Well, that sounds very Leftovers, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> What is it going to do with kangaroos? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, well, Chris, look, I, I thank you for your time today. We hope The Leftovers um, uh, do really well at the Emmys. They deserve it. Season two was a real success, and we wish you all the best with season three as well. Thanks very much. Thanks for talking to me. Going back.